Hello, my name is Carl Morrison. I'm a pathologist at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. My role at Roswell Park is to lead our personalized medicine efforts through the Center for Personalized Medicine. And today I'm going to give you a very brief primer about a very timely talk topic called an introduction to next generation sequencing for oncologists. I want to start with my disclosures today, and that is I have a minority interest in OmniSeq which is a for-profit subsidiary of Roswell Park that really does focus on next generation sequencing and its applications to clinical care. We have two major high-level learning objectives. One is to recognize that next generation sequencing is a very sound technological process with highly accurate results. And number two, most important to you today as the oncologist, right, is that the NGS or the next generation sequencing annotation process, including the relevant parameters that surround that are the most important thing that you should understand in the care of your patients. So I want to go back just to give you a little historical context, right? Next generation sequencing is a process that really, really uh, started about 10 to 12 years ago. It was a paradigm shift in 2003. Right? We sequenced the first human genome. Shortly thereafter, we moved into what we call massively parallel sequencing rather than sequencing one read at a time like we do in typical Sanger sequencing or power sequencing. We were sequencing millions of reads at one time. And that was the term come along, massively parallel sequencing. That didn't sound so good, so people reached the term next generation sequencing sounded a little better. Uh, not going to go through all this history across this timeline. One of the most important thing I wanted to point out, right, is that there are two leading vendors today of next generation sequencing equipment. There's one from Life Technologies called the Ion Torrent System, which includes the PGM or personal genome machine and the Ion Proton, right? The major competitor today is from the company called Illumina. It's the MySeq, which produces multiple, uh, multiple instrumentations across various levels of complexity. But nonetheless, these two competing interests have, been, have done a great job in driving the cost of the technology down to something that we can now put into the clinical care. There are really six major steps to next generation sequencing. Uh, you can carve these up in different ways and make more steps or less steps, but I've included these right as pre-analytics, library preparation, target enrichment, sequencing, bioinformatics, and annotation. Probably bioinformatics is the one that you, you most frequently hear of because you think there's a lot of, you know, it's kind of like a black box, but trust me, all these processes are equally important. So let's start with pre-analytics, right? So pre-analytics is, you know, how do we take a specimen that we take from some pathology archives and turn it into data that you get on your screen or get in a pathology report? Okay, so we have to start somewhere transforming that specimen, pre-analytics. The important point here for you as the oncologist and treating patients every day is that we no longer need frozen high-quality specimens to make next-generation sequencing work. FFPE specimens, formalin-fixed paraffin embedded specimens are acceptable, right? The next important point, right, is that these two competing interests, MySeq and Ion Torrent, both use FFPE specimens, but the Ion Torrent uses a lot less DNA and a lot less specimens than does the Illumina-based test. So if you've got a patient that has a very small biopsy and you don't, you don't want to have to consider taking that patient back for more material, you may want to utilize that in choosing which type of test you're wanting to put this patient through. So the next step is, is library preparations, right? So this is the step you never hear of. And this is really the heart and soul of next generation sequencing. This is where all the cost is. This is where all the work is. This is what all the people do, right? This is what happens before it ever goes on a sequencer. Before ever that sample gets put on one of these million dollar machines, there's some tech sitting in a lab somewhere using a pipette mixing reagents and TAC polymerases and all this stuff together and they're labeling this DNA in specific ways so that we can get to these final results. So don't want to belager all the technical points about library preparation just to understand this is the part you never hear of and this is where all the work is. Target enrichment, right? So what is library preparation really trying to do? It's trying to pull out that part of the genome that you want to analyze. It's impractical to think that we're going to analyze the whole genome for patients for clinical care in today's world, right? So, you know, if you go down from the whole genome, you go to exome, you go to targeted sequencing, and you go to hotspots, right? So this is what targeted enrichment is, right? There's two basic ways of doing it. One's called hybridization-based. The other one's called PCR-based. And under PCR-based, the most common technology today is something called emulsion PCR. 
no way I expect you in this 15 minute discussion to understand the difference between hybridization based, PCR based. Just understand that there are two ways of doing this. Each has its own applications. Basically hybridization based is when you're doing exomes. PCR based is when you're doing targeted sequencing, okay? So sequencing, now oh, we're finally through the part that you've all heard everything about, right? Basically again, we have two different technologies, Illumina, on torrent. Illumina is really Sanger sequencing on a glass slide multiplied by a million times, right? It's sequencing by synthesis. You flood a, fluor a fluorescently labeled DNA analog onto a glass slide and every time that's incorporated, you take a picture. That's why this results in huge amounts of data because you have to tile all these pictures up into one file and then make an interpretation. <clears throat> Ion torrent, the beauty of that, it's sequencing on a semiconductor chip. So basically every time you add a DNA analog in, it changes the pH in these little micro wells on a semiconductor and that pH is detected. Much simpler process, doesn't require near as much storage space. Um, probably it's downside is something called homopolymers. So if you are putting in multiple analog, DNA analogs of the same type, like a string of A's or a string of T's, it can't distinguish between six T's and seven T's. So it has its limitation, but still these are two very totally different methodologies that have both of them very sound process. So bioinformatics, yeah, this is the part you've heard all about, right? You probably never understand it, it's a black box. <clears throat> I basically divided it into about seven different things here, right? The raw data, which you hear people talk about, fast Q files, right? People want their fast Q file for research purposes. The bioinformaticians apply these QC and filters to the fast Q files. They align it up with the human reference genome. And then they assemble all that and then they do the read counts or how many counts you have at each one of these assembly points. Then they put in a variant column. So variant calling is where the rubber really hits the road. This is the part that is important, right? There are different variant callers that will get you different variant, will give you different list of variants based upon uh, even the same file, but in the end you get this thing called the VCF, right? The variant call format file. This is where the really results are that then go to uh, the, the annotation process. But many ways to get to a VCF file, but the important thing, remember, if you get to the VCF, you're close to home, okay? Annotation. So this is the part that you as the oncologist should have the most interest in because this is the part that most often impacts your patient, right? When you get that VCF file or that list of variants, right, what do you do with them then? So there are many databases, right, that people use for annotation. I just listed some of them here. ClinVar, DBGAP, DBVAR, DBSNP, Thomson Reuters Clinical Genomics Browser, Cosmic. If you put all these together, I think I sat down one day and said that there's at least 40, close to 5,000 genes annotated in all these databases together. Uh, <clears throat> I know at least in Cosmic, there's over 250,000 tumors annotated, and there's about 50,000 somatic mutation calls across all these various databases. And I wouldn't even want to estimate the number of germline calls there are across all these different databases. But this is the important point, because it really determines in the end what is actionable, right? How will you treat your patient? And it's not just what is actionable, but what are the levels of evidence about actionability, right? Are you going to act upon a particular variant? And I suppose let me back up a half a step here, right? We need to start thinking about actionability and levels of evidence, not at the gene level, but at the variant level. Every single nucleotide position, every mutation that ever occurred in that gene. So would you want to treat your patient upon a variant that's never been described in the literature? Maybe it's adjacent to a variant that's been described, right? Or would you prefer to treat your patient based upon a variant that is in the NCCN guidelines. Although the NCCN guidelines typically for the most part only do gene levels of evidence and not variant levels of evidence. But this is the field that oncologists really need to delve into, right? And there's no way here in a few minutes we're gonna know all the details about annotation. But you should spend a lot of your time and you should question your clinical reports, you should question your clinical research about what were the level of evidence for that particular actual variant that that one person was describing to me. So, going to summarize this and conclude this, that the important point for you is that next generation sequencing is a very sound technical process. Both platform leading, both leading processes today, both produce good results, right? What you as a treating physician need to take your concern about is annotation and what are the values that I'm using? How much precision am I using to take that data and actually treat my patient and choose a drug?
And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your time today. Carl Morrison, Roswell Park. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us at through email or phone. Thank you very much.